Welcome to today's program. I'm Nick Kihas. Today we will look at a few different arguments for the existence of God. You know, have you ever wondered why is there something rather than nothing? It was Gottfried Leibniz of Germany who raised that question. Literally, he said, he was a, a German philosopher. He says, why is there something rather than nothing? And of course, out of nothing, nothing comes. You know, something can produce something, but out of nothing, nothing comes. So why is the universe here? Where did it all come from? Where is it going? Even the believer, the Christian believer, um, sometimes is a little, you know, shady on, 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 on the evidence that's available for the existence of God. Multiple, many arguments, much support for the existence of God has been given through the church fathers all the way up to the modern era. But you know what's very interesting is right now, today, as science is exploding and astronomy and Big Bang cosmology uh, is exploding at the scientific level, guess what? The old biblical and philosophical arguments for the existence of God are now also scientifically strengthened. So what is cosmology? Cosmology is, is, is a very interesting field of study. It deals with the origin or the beginning of the universe. Cosmology is the study of the origin or the beginning of the universe. Cosmos in Greek means world, order, or universe. So why are we here? Where are we going? Is there purpose to the universe? You know, is there a God who created the world like Genesis 1-1 says? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke the physical universe into existence. Powerful stuff. So what are some of these arguments for the existence of God? One of my favorite arguments was developed by William Lane Craig. And uh, it's known as the Kalam Cosmological Argument. K-A-L-A-M. The Kalam Cosmological Argument. Now, Kalam is an Arabic word because the Al-Kindi and Al-Ghazali were Islamic mystics, actually pantheists, who were working on developing and strengthening this argument. Of course, Aristotle and other philosophers like John Philoponus developed some of these arguments, though different versions, way before the advent of Islam. So um, if you look at, at Aristotle, you have cosmological arguments. If you look at the Christian apologists, Irenaeus, Athanasius, going all the way up to you know, the Reformation era, including the days of Thomas Aquinas, for crying out loud, in the 1200s, he developed five ways. It's called five ways of God, five arguments for the existence of God. One of them, or two of them, actually cosmological in nature. So how does the Kalam argument go? It goes something like this. Number one, anything that begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. And a cause is someone who is bringing a certain event or an effect about. Every effect has a cause. That's science. Every effect has a cause. You know, if you drop a pencil on the floor, you're the cause of making that pencil drop. But a pencil is not going to drop on the floor on its own, by itself. Things move. Things that are in motion or being moved are moved by some mover, if you will. So, looking at cosmology now, is there evidence for premise one, the idea that anything that begins to exist has a cause? Sure there is. Again, laws of causality clearly state that all effects have causes. So if the universe had a beginning point, that it bursted into existence some time ago, then there must be a cause behind that. So, for example, uh, we can look at the Big Bang. The universe resulted from a giant explosion. Here's a question to ask. Do explosions occur on their own? No. Somebody had to light the match. <laughs> so who lit the match as far as the origin of the world? Well, we say God did so. So anything that begins to exist has a cause. 
if you were to suggest, well, I actually don't think so. I think the universe just came into being by nothing on its own, etc. Big problems with that, because out of nothing, nothing comes. Something can produce something else, but nothing can produce something. Are you with me? So in that sense, when we claim that all effects have causes, and if the universe is an effect because it began to exist, then it must have had a cause. So premise two says the universe began to exist. Do we have evidence for that? Absolutely. We know today that the universe is running out, it's thinning out due to massively expanding. All right, It's like a giant balloon and you add air to the balloon and it's growing and growing and growing. Now imagine if you put little stars on the balloon and as you blow up the balloon, the stars are just moving further and further and further away. If we were to have that on a DVD, the expansion of the universe, and we would hit the rewind button and rewind the expansion of the universe, right? Where did it start? It had a beginning point because it had to begin to expand. Isn't that interesting? All right? The sun is shrinking some five feet per hour. Stars are burning out. Everything in the world is running toward death, toward decay. Thank God for the Christian message that it doesn't end here. On this earth, you know, we're not just food for worms like the atheists would say. You know, it's not... Uh, Mother Nature, who vomited us into existence, and one day the earth will swallow us whole again, and we, we shall be no more. No, there's resurrection. We have a soul. There's an immaterial nature to man, and we will live with him forever. Thank goodness for that message, for that hope. No wonder people are lost, committing suicide, and almost drinking themselves to death because they have no hope. Atheism is bankrupt when it comes to hope. In any event, the expansion of the universe and the fact that stars are burning out, the fact that everything is running toward decay, does indicate that it was birthed, that it had a beginning point. So the second premise in the argument, let's restate the argument. Anything that begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist, therefore it requires a cause. Now there are three main views as to the origin of the world. One is that the universe is eternal. It's always been and always will be. All right? Another one says that the universe created itself. And of course, our view is that the universe was created by someone other than itself. Let's look at the argument of the universe being eternal. Some claim that the universe has always been and always will be. That's a problem. Because science tells us that the universe, again, is running out. It's running down. It's running towards decay. It will collapse in a heat death. All right? So just utter annihilation awaits us. <laughs> That's the scientific view apart from God. But we don't have to worry as believers. Right? Because he created the world. He's sustaining the world. And when the world is no more, we shall be up there with him forevermore. Very good and solid uh, evidence, I think, for Christianity being true. So looking now at the eternity of the world, is it possible that the universe has always been and always will be? I don't think so. Some of the ancient thinkers argued this way. Um, if the universe is eternal, it should have burned up an eternity ago. But here we are. That's a very profound statement. Because if the universe has been headed toward heat death, and will one day be no more. It can't possibly have been running out of energy or toward death for eternity. It should have burned up an eternity ago, right? But here we are. So the universe can't be infinite or eternal. What about the second position, that the universe is self-created? The universe just made itself. I want you to think about this. If the universe created itself, that means it would have to exist before it created itself. So really, you haven't offered much in that argument. 
In other words, let's say the universe created itself at point two. I'm going to create myself at point two. But to create myself, I would have to be in existence before I created myself. Do you see how that works? So it's really just a fancy way or an, an attempt, if you will, to, to explain away the idea that maybe there is a God who brought the universe into existence. So looking at it that way, the universe is not eternal. It would have burned up an eternity ago. Here we are. Number two, the fact that, or the argument that the universe is self-created is, is philosophically absurd because it would have to exist before it created itself. So now you're back to it being eternal. So point A and B doesn't follow. But what does make sense is the universe coming into existence by a creator. You know, I said earlier that out of nothing, nothing comes. Uh, we have minds. We have brains. We have IQ. You know, we think and reflect about things. A further principle of Newtonian physics, that's what it used to be called, is the idea that the effect is never greater than its cause. So all effects have causes, but the effect is never greater than its cause. That was one problem with Lucifer. He was created by God, and then one day he wanted to be greater than God. Well, he really bumped his head, because that's not going to happen. It's absolutely impossible. You can't be greater than your creator, which is also, by the way, why God couldn't create another God. Because if he created a second God, guess what? The second God would not be like the first God, because the second God would be dependent on the first God creating him. Because the God we believe in is self-existing. He wasn't caused by anybody. He doesn't have parents. He is the first cause himself uncaused. Nothing brought God into being. Okay? So, when you're looking at these arguments for and against the existence of God, the Kalam cosmological argument is very, very powerful. One thing I want to mention is the word Kalam, it means dialect or speech. Dialect or speech. If you combine that with cosmology, the study of the universe, and you write it out in a sentence, you actually get the study of divine speech in nature. Isn't that awesome? Do you know? What we're doing in today's show is what's called natural theology. The psalmist said, the heavens declare the glory of God. You know, Paul, uh, in Romans chapter 1, says that we are without excuse. I, I, I'm re uh, recalling Blaise Pascal of France. He says that the evidence of God in nature is so clear to everyone who has an open heart and mind. But the evidence of the existence of God is also sufficiently vague in order not to compel those whose hearts are closed. I like that. Pascal was a young writer. Maybe he launched his writings a little too early in his career. Maybe some of us have been there. I certainly was. But having said that, uh, he was on to something. But Paul says, we're without excuse. It's evident that God exists. We just suppress, continually reject the evidence given by God. But I'll tell you what, astronomers, not too many of them are atheists anymore. They see a fine-tuning in the world. They see that we have intelligence and intelligence can't come from non-intelligence. You know, the whole argument uh, from goo to the zoo to you, which is evolution, right? If Mother Earth, that doesn't think, created us as accidental freaks of nature, right? And over billions of years, we somehow developed brains and intelligence. You know what that means? That means we are now more intelligent than our cause. And that never works in science. You know, a cockroach is not going to produce a car. A cockroach cannot produce a camera. A fish will never build an airplane because it lacks that intelligence. So can you get mind from non-mind? No. Can you get intelligence from non-intelligence? No. Major problems for atheism. And of course, what does the atheist say? Well, the evidence isn't in yet. We're waiting. Some atheists now 
actually believe that aliens created us. I kid you not. Why? Because the argument from intelligent design is so overwhelming that you can't get mind or intelligence from non-mind or non-intelligence that maybe there's something out there. Well, why do you have to say it's an alien? Why can't you just bow the knee and say there's obviously an omniscient, all-powerful creator who brought the universe and man and everything in it into existence? What is so unreasonable about that? Really, you're going to put your money on a Las Vegas table bidding that aliens brought us into being? Interesting thing is, I'm not making too much fun of it. I mean, I think it sounds funny. But having said that, um, it's interesting how some atheists are actually turning to aliens to say, maybe they brought us into existence. So intelligence, the argument from intelligence and, and intelligent design and information, information in the DNA, right? Information theory are overwhelmingly powerful in today's era. So arguments for the existence of God are just overwhelming. I just shared a few with you. But the Kalam cosmological argument is a very exciting argument because it deals with astrophysics. It deals with astronomy. It deals with physics. And philosophically, it is tight. It is right on the money. And again, like I said, old philosophical arguments being boosted by scientific in inquiry. Anything that begins to exist requires a cause. The universe began to exist Three, therefore, it was cost. And, of course, this cause we call God. You know, when the scriptures say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. As far as I know, the Judeo-Christian scriptures is the only religious book on the face of the earth that actually claimed that the universe was brought into existence. So if you're reading a book, a religious book, that says the universe is eternal, or it created itself, or it rests on animals walking, uh, and that's why we have earthquakes, and so on. Um, probably a good idea to rethink that. So, interestingly, modern science is catching up with biblical truth, that the universe is not eternal, but God spoke it into existence. So that would be a version of the cosmological argument, and you, there's tons, tons of information for you to pursue this. We need to know what we believe and why. And, and, and hear me, folks. The evidence is on our side. We're standing on the shoulders of intellectual giants who loved God in the past, all the way from the early church fathers up till the C.S. Lewis, um, Alvin Plantinga, and the modern apologists. You know, we don't have to come up with all new stuff on our own. We have 2,000 years of great theological and Christian philosoph philosophers writing on these subjects. All we need to do is read that, and we can bring a message of hope and answers to a dying world that are demanding answers, and we need to have those answers. You know, uh, when you have some time, read chapter 17 in the book of Acts. Paul shows up in Athens, right? And he's ready to engage the philosophers and his Jewish brothers at the synagogue. It says that he was in the synagogues preaching and arguing that Jesus was the Messiah. And then he would be in the public square, right? Arguing with the philosophers, the Stoics and the Epicureans. He knew their stuff. Not only did Paul study under Gamaliel, Rabbi Gamaliel in Jerusalem, who was the heavyweight on theology in Paul's day. But he also studied philosophy. Because when he walks into Athens, he drops quotes by some of their own Greek poets. He says, you know, for in him we live and move and have our being. That was a quote from a Greek poet. He says, you know what? We are God's offspring. Not literally, because God is spirit, John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But not literally offspring like a mother delivers a baby, right? Um, but it's true in that we are created in the Im image of God, and that our existence depends on God causing us to be, so to speak. So 
Paul is actually able to meet the Epicureans and the Stoics where they were at. He came from Jerusalem, the religious capital of the world, into Athens, the intellectual capital of the world, and he was able to stand his ground, you know? And it says that a few believed. He did have some fruit. So what he did is he actually began with natural theology, you know, raising questions about the existence of God, and uh, he even applauded their religious statues. He wasn't encouraging paganism, but he says, wow, you guys have like all these idols or, or pillars made to every god in the world, but over here I noticed that there's a statue that says to the unknown god. You know what Paul did? He says, this is the God that I'm going to proclaim to you. you got to love the, the Greeks of that day. They literally had a statue that says to the unknown God because they were polytheistic. They believed in many gods. So in case they missed one, they had a statue to the unknown God. And Paul jumped on that opportunity. He seized the moment and said, look, this unknown God I've come to explain to you. And he did. And then, of course, after his 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 dealing with the Epicureans and the Stoics and his case for natural theology, the idea that we can deduce that God exists based on nature alone, he went into the resurrection of Jesus. They never even heard of such a thing. When he was talking about Jesus literally, physically ri rising from the dead and that we are sinners and we can be saved by the blood of Christ because only salvation is attainable through the work of Jesus Christ. He said on the cross, it is finished. What is finished? The work of salvation. God, I love that. So what, what did they say? They said in Acts 17, what does this babbler, babbler have to say? We want to hear more about this tomorrow. I mean, they entertained every idea, you know. But there was fruit. People did come to believe. So I look at Paul's model of ministry, you know, his missionary journeys. Uh, he, I mean, he was in prison. He was beaten, shipwrecked multiple times, and he never gave up. You know, two churches supported him, two churches. He would literally be on a boat, broke, hitting a shore, walk and see the local tent maker. Yeah, he actually had a trade, building tents, and he would go to the local tent maker, make enough money so he could continue to preach. Two churches in the early church supported Paul that I'm aware of. You would think they would all support him, right? And never mind, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament that we have today. Interesting. Some of those epistles were penned down in jail while he was chained to a Roman soldier. He never gave up. He was beaten. But he was brilliant, he knew spiritual truth. He knew philosophical truth. He knew theological truth. And that's where we see Paul saying, becoming all things to all men. He could meet them where they were at. This doesn't mean we go out there and argue with everybody. Christianity is not about arguing. Arguing, Yes, in one sense, anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of Christ, we have to tear it down like a wall, the scriptures say. At the same time, we have to learn how to be meek and gentle and show respect because ultimately we want to reach that person who feels inside that something is broken. It needs repairing, you know, that conscience, the Holy Spirit convicting them, look, you need to get right with God. Ultimately, that's who we're trying to reach. So we need to be salt and light, not just spiritually, but having the answers because we have the answers, all right? So what we did today is a field of what's called apologetics, apologetica, which means defending the Christian faith. And we will continue to do so. Uh, many books have been written on the subject. You know, if you want to get into cults, you should read Walter Martin's book, Kingdom of the Cults. If you want to read a case for why Christianity alone is the adequate means of salvation, you can pick up my book. If you want to read uh, uh, more on the Kalam cosmological argument, you can go online and pick up William Lane Craig's book, Reasonable Faith. Very good piece. We defense that argument to the T. In fact, he did his doctorate on that argument alone in England, the University of Birmingham under John Hick. So, a lot of good stuff out there. Uh, in our next program, we will continue in our series of apologetic studies, defending Christianity because it's true truth 
It is historical truth. Meanwhile, stay blessed and continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Shalom. Was I good on time?